Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for December 6, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Center for, uh, excuse me, Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is lessons learned from a real world ransomware attack on researchers at Michigan State University. Our presenters are Vaughn Welch, Tom Sue, and Andrew Adams. Vaughn is the Associate VP for Information Security at Indiana University, the Executive Director for Cybersecurity Innovation at Indiana University, Executive Director for the OmniSoc, the Director of IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, CACR, and the Director of Trusted CI. Tom is the CISO uh, at Michigan State University, and Andrew is the Principal Information Security Officer at Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center and the CISO at Trusted CI. Before we begin, a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, um, participants are welcome to ask questions. We hope this uh, is a more collaborative uh, presentation, so go ahead and type your questions and I'll um, uh, read them uh, to the uh, presenters. And with that, let's hand things over to Vaughn. Vaughn, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeanette. And I welcome to our audience here on this uh, lovely December morning. So as you may have inferred from Jeanette's introduction, what we're going to be presenting here was some collaborative work done between Trusted CI and Michigan State University, specifically the CIO's office with uh, Tom Su, the CISO on point, but also want to acknowledge, uh, you know, Melissa Wu as, as CIO as being very instrumental in helping this come about. And let me also acknowledge, you'll be hearing from Andrew, Tom, and I today, but the report has uh, another co-author, uh, Julie Sanger from our communications office here, who is joining us here today on the webinar. And so go ahead to the next slide, please, Jeanette. So what you're gonna be seeing here today is a high level overview of the report that we wrote after doing a set of interviews with the involved personnel from Michigan's State University. This is a, a publicly available report. You can see the, the URL there on your, on your screen. And so our hope today is to encourage you to go read that report and ultimately help us disseminate this information out to the research community who we believe would benefit from understanding some of the increased risks that ransomware brings to their research. And then some of the, the guidance the report presents in how to adapt to that risk. So specifically, and uh, if you would next slide me, please, Jeanette. So what we're gonna to present to you here today between the three of us is first of all, I'll be passing to Tom next, who's gonna talk uh, about the actual cyber attack at Michigan State University last year. And then we'll be passing to Andrew Adams to talk some about the lessons that our interviews and analysis uh, suggest could be beneficial for the research community. And then we hope to have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. And so uh, please be thinking about those, putting them into the chat or uh, we'll or raising them when the, the Q and A uh, session comes up. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn the floor over to uh, Tom Sue, the uh, Chief Information Security Officer from Michigan State University. Thank you, Tom, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Vaughn, and thanks, Andrew, and, and, and everybody for asking us to come, come participate here today. Um, my name is Tom Sue. I'm the CISO here at Michigan State University. Um, this event actually heard, occurred before I arrived at Michigan State University, although I was still involved with the um, long tail of the cleanup of the cycle of this, um, the, uh, and, and, and especially involved in the trusted CI engagement. So um, I, I'm excited to have have this opportunity to share this with you in this community. Overall, um, what happened in July, uh, June and May, actually end of May, early June 2020, was we were in the middle of the pandemic. 
uh, Michigan State University was in kind of a closed down remote learning teaching environment. Um, people were not working on site. And um, the uh, physics and astronomy department was hit with the NetWalker ransomware. It came via a, a departmental VPN that was in test mode and had been left running. They weren't intending to run, leave it open. And so they were, uh, they had left an, uh, basically this VPN running that had a vulnerability was exploited. That exploit allowed the attackers to uh, gain credentials within the physics astronomy department's environment uh, because the VPN was not part of the university environment, uh, the overall university environment, and the physics astronomy department had their own uh, infrastructure set up running um, at, at the point of which is explained in the report uh, for their own particular needs. And um, but what happened was they had a number of vulnerabilities in many servers as well as particular clients um, out of date in the hygienic space. Um, it allowed them to, to do what you need. Sometimes in the science department, you have to run old equipment, but do you want it have, it have it exposed? In this particular case, they got exposed to that vulnerable VPN. The impact was significant for them. Uh, two, two main aspects, as we were seeing four or five different types of ransomware, at this time, ransomware was just becoming uh, the part of the exfiltration ransom, as well as the mm -hmm. installing malware and locking up the equipment. So first piece is that uh, the, the attackers got to a file server. Um, it was unstructured data that hosted data for multiple departments, not just the physics astronomy department, which was interesting. Um, and that data started to be exfiltrated. The administrator was able to catch some of that and interrupt the service. Um, but then they also they attacked and propagated malware to a number of a couple hundred of machines in the department, including some file servers that were departmental file servers, as well as the ones that we were talking about, research boxes and, and, and clients within the department. Um, then they started with more uh, approaching more lateral movement within that IT department, which was the physics astronomy department exclusively. The physics astronomy department was not using university's active directory infrastructure. So uh, the attack was limited to them. Our overall response was quite, um, quite good considering uh, people had to come in from working remotely, uh, mask up, apply all of the uh, COVID uh, requirements uh, for safety uh, to get in the department to do some of that work. Mm -hmm. But in the longer term, this took over a year. If you think about the initial cleanup, um, some of the big challenges that were occurred with this were um, that unstructured data. If you usually have an attack or a disclosure or a breach type of situation on a database or a database environment, you know what's in there. In this particular case, um, our team had to work with our analytics and data team to figure out actually what data was affected by uh, this exfiltration. Um, that way we knew how many people were affected or what type of information was there. And it took a good deal of extra work. We hired external agencies to help with that assessment once our analytics team did produce that. But uh, it shows you that if you have your good connections within, within IT and having some analytics, this was a skill that was not present within the IT department, um, with the information security and incident response team, the analysis of what was happening. But uh, engaging with our AD or analytics, analytics data services accelerated our ability to know the true impact. Uh, additionally, we um, engaged with external services to do notifications. Um, and one thing that I think is an interesting twist that you should all know <clears throat> is that um, I hadn't done, a, a, I hadn't experienced as a CISO a breach of this nature in quite a while. And a number of US states as well as countries require pre-notification of their privacy offices before you notify um, uh, affected persons. So that added another layer that you need to consider when you do these type of breaches that you have to mm -hmm. notify and notify and yet then notify. Um, so those are a, a different set of layers that each, some states have different varying requirements in the 50 states of the United States. And this also affected people in international space. So we had to deal with um, privacy offices in, in various countries. Um, and I think as we talk a little later, I can go into some of the interesting nuances around that. But broader impact, um, the uh, MSU did not pay the, the proposed ransom and we did not, uh, we just basically cleaned up after the fact. And um, so that's a, a, 
brief summary that I can in one slide without going on and on. Um, you can read it in the report. We really wanted to give you guys a, a fresh um, a fresh look at what had happened. And I'll, again, I can answer any questions about that later. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew, who will talk about the trusted CIA engagement. Andrew? Uh, real quick, before we jump to that, um, we oh. have a question. What operating system was the VPN service running on? Um, it was... Um, it was running in a, in a VM actually, um, but it was a, a, a Windows op. I'll have to get back to you. I don't know, I don't wanna say it because there's a couple in my mind that are opposite. So um, let me get back to you on that. And that was Horst. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, I'm Andrew Adams of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center at Carnegie Mellon University and a member of Trusted CI. And I'll be talking about our process in interviewing those involved in the MSU incident, um, as well as relating the highlights and um, key points that emerged from those interviews. So after talking with the CIO's office at MSU, we identified several from both the IT side of MSU, uh, that is uh, those involved in the IR process and the at the time interim CISO, um, and from the physics and astronomy department, including the chair, as well as the dean of natural sciences. Uh, next slide, please. So from the interviews, clear patterns emerged. Uh, a few were divergencies, uh, specifically between the centralized IT folks and the representatives from physics and astronomy. Uh, the first of these materialized when asking members from each group to relate what they thought the the, the cost to science was as a result of the incident. Uh, nearly all of the centralized IT folks measured this loss in months. Uh, that is, it took a little over a month from the outbreak of the ransomware until some systems were back up, or it was roughly six months to get most of physics and astronomy back online. Um, representatives from physics and astronomy department, interestingly, answered that question in years, not months. Uh, not only did they aggregate all of the research projects that had been disrupted, but notice that one research project in particular lost an entire year's worth of data on their own. Um, needless to say, that group lamented MSU's decision not to pay the ransom. A second divergence appeared uh, in referring to the qualifications of the physics and astronomy IT staff, uh, specifically their cybersecurity skill set. Uh, the physics and astronomy members we interviewed thought their IT staff at the time of the incident were very capable, according to them. Uh, the incident didn't occur from a uh, lack of security knowledge, but from a lack of resources in implementing and following security protocols. The folks from centralized IT, however, found that sufficient knowledge in the realm of security was lacking. Uh, for example, they pointed out that the backup system, which was put in place for disaster recovery, lacked a very basic security principle, uh, that is uh, isolated redundant backups. Uh, the network attached storage device used for disaster recovery in the physics and astronomy department was connected to many things. Um, and unfortunately that backup drive was one of the systems that was hit with the ransomware. Uh, next slide, please. All right, the differences aside, uh, there were three overarching abstractions or what we refer to as factors uh, that emanated from the interviews. And it's fairly easy to perceive that these factors in a way nurtured the pending incident. Um, so physics and astronomy was one of the first departments to have cyber infrastructure at MSU and their IT staff actually predates MSU's security team and centralized IT. Hence, there was an ongoing belief within physics and astronomy uh, akin to a culture uh, that they knew more about cybersecurity than MSU. Uh, and in fact, that may have been true for a couple of decades, uh, but the culture never died off within the department. And this certainly contributed to the next factor, uh, and that is going it alone, which physics and astronomy had opted for. Um, indeed, it's possible to go it alone, uh, but you must be abreast of the current threat landscape uh, and you have to have adequate resources to address the risks present in that landscape. Uh, physics and astronomy lack both. Um, in fact, at times they resisted help from centralized IT. In retrospect, however, uh, perhaps centralized IT should have pushed physics and astronomy a little harder to engage them in that key cybersecurity dialogue. Uh, the last factor I want to mention, and I'm sure <laughs> 
nearly everyone in academia can relate to this. Uh, but as I alluded to earlier, uh, when noting that physics and astronomy thought their IT staff was competent, uh, but did not have enough resources to maintain the uh, necessary security hygiene, it turns out that this deficit was due in part to physics and astronomy condoning an atmosphere in which faculty uh, akin to the squeaky wheel getting the oil push their research agendas as the priority for the understaffed physics and astronomy IT staff. Um, thus critical security tasks, for example, uh, patch maintenance became secondary. It was the classic usability and or productivity trumping security scenario. Um, I'd like to conclude by sharing a question that was asked of one of our interviewees by a former student shortly after the obligatory PII exposure notices were sent out by MSU. Um, and the question asked by the former student paraphrased was, after three decades, why did you still have my personal data on your server? I'm going to hand the presentation back over to Vaughn now. Oh, briefly, uh, we, do, we do have the answer to the, the um, operating system question. It was a Pulse VPN running on a Windows server host. And uh, Vaughn, we do have a question coming in. Would you like to answer that before you continue? Yeah, I think that's actually uh, directed to Tom, but I think let's go ahead and do that. Yep. Um, question, were you able to determine the specific B VPN exploit that was used? And if so, are you able to share? Thank you. Um, yes, we were. Um, I don't have that specific thing in front of me. I wasn't expecting to give as many technical details today, but um, that it, it was a common VPN vulnerability on the Pulse VPN that had been published um, about six months prior to this exploit. So they had basically ran a, a test VPN and left it running. And, and since it was a test, they didn't bother to do the up patching. So um, anything with Pulse VPN that you patch, you would remove that particular case right now. So it's not a, in, in the wild right now, if that's what you're looking for. We have another question here. I think. Tom said the overall response was good. What yardstick or scale were you using to measure that? Um, I was, uh, Adam, a great question. Um, the, uh, when I say good response, I, I, I was using that as a concept from the, uh, the people participating in it were helpful on, and, and um, I said the feedback that we got from our, our users in the physics and astronomy department and our team, that's why I'm calling it as a good response. Um, it was within a couple of days of the of the response um, of, of our notification, meaning that we got notified and we were on it right away. Considering in in COVID, when people were working remotely, they weren't always on 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 call all the time. So that was a if you were going to say an SLA, which we didn't have an SLA, it was within a two hour SLA that we responded. So that would be the first thing I could point to you. But overall, and if I if I say it from the outside, having come look at this after the fact. Um, a good response in, in my perspective was, did we keep it from spreading? And that was the case, spreading beyond the physics and astronomy department. It did spread within the department, but that was by the, by the time we'd received the notification. Um, that group was not being monitored by the central IT organization. So it was the administrator in physics astronomy who noticed the problem and called for help. And that was definitely uh, a good response from our standpoint. They worked through the night in order to do the uh, triage. And let me just add to that a, a little bit of, if I may, um, you know, from, from Trusted CI's perspective, I mean, first of all, we've been extremely grateful to Michigan State for, for sharing what they did about this event. I think overall, way too many of these events just go unshared um, for, for various reasons, and, and many of them are, are respectable. But I think if you look at Sharing something like this, we're really hoping that the community can learn from it. You know, I also point to um, Australia National University. It was back in 2018, 2019, uh, shared uh, details of one of the events they had there. Overall, I think we need more of this. And as part of what I want to, want to say about this, I mean, just subjectively, we've seen nothing here at Michigan State University that, you know, I don't think I've seen dozens of other places Including, including here at, at IU. So I'm hoping no one is taking this as criticism 
uh, towards Michigan State University. In fact, on the opposite, I laud them for, for participating uh, in this. And actually, I would, uh, I, looking at the questions uh, in there, I see the one, I'll pick up on the one from Bob Lord, because it was one that I was going to ask here, but then I also noticed we can get back to Eric Cross's. Um, Tom, maybe if you want to take a moment and talk about, you know, what changes have been implemented uh, there at, at Michigan State since this has happened, uh, as always, you know, there's always room for improvement at all of our universities. Well, sure, that's a great uh, question as well. Um, a, a number of things have changed, uh, specifically the physics astronomy department and a number of other departments have ceased at our behest sharing this information to run their own VPNs and they've started to use the university's infrastructure VPN, which is protected with logging, authentication, multi-factor authentication, and user roles. Um, it's just sort of been a sense of convenience. I need to test something, I'll stand something up. I don't need to go through a change control process in order to get something. So we've adopt, uh, enrolled them into the more, I would say, robust university um, uh, tools and services. Uh, the second thing is uh, we did invest in some contract teams to completely integrate their environment into the university's active directory environment, which is um, specifically managed uh, to a higher level of, of control degree, as well as um, greater um, flexibility for these users and units. They didn't have to continue spending their whole time running an active directory infrastructure. So now they have, uh, they have their own uh, OU groups, but they're on the core infrastructure now. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we also spend a good deal of time upgrading and patching and a lot of these machines that had been uh, locked up needed complete rebuilds. So uh, a good deal of investment was spent to upgrade the hardware upgrade endpoints and patch and do fresh installs on all these items. Um, the business systems were up pretty quickly, but it was the bigger impact was many of the researchers. As uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, some people did not have any of their data mm -hmm. and they had to restore, or rework what they had done from other areas. Plus, a good deal of analysis had to be done to ensure that uh, we didn't have any lingering point, points of, um, of, of reinfection possibilities. Uh, we did have some vendors help us out by giving us some tools that we deployed across the environment to uh, find the impact of that space. But everything was essentially rebuilt. That's the kind of nightmare DR type of scenario you have in a ransomware scenario, a ransomware case. Do I have the ability to be resilient enough to recover that entire environment? Um, I know I have colleagues in the healthcare environment that had to deal with those particular cases. A complete rebuild is a, is a big, I would say, a big endeavor. And if you haven't planned for it, you're, you're going to have a, a, a longer term of outage in, in your environment if you have that happen. So um, that was the big piece, uh, getting physics astronomy to, to, um, to actually upgrade and address the hygiene in their environment. We've also done some organizational changes where central IT is assisting much more and, um, and the department is much more open to having that type of guidance and assistance as we're working on a semi-distributed IT support model where the IT staff has support from central IT, um, but they're also still situated within their schools and departments, but they're not fully autonomous now. And I think that's a, a good thing. But as coming from the central IT organization, we need to continue to say, look, let's make sure we're addressing the core key requirements for researchers. And a lot of those are, are variant, uh, much broader than what just an academic institution can do. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, I think I, I addressed that. So there's a lot of challenges, a lot of changes that took place. And that department is now looking like any other department on campus. Um, future state, uh, I believe they're much more resilient. And uh, we want to make sure other departments in the sciences that are around or near them or the collaborate with physics and astronomy uh, also learn from these lessons. Thanks, let's go back to the question earlier and, and it looks like Tom answered it in the chat, but I'll go ahead and read it. How much time elapsed between the ransomware's initial detection to the final file being encrypted? I ask an attempt to understand the difficulty in identifying the issue and final isolation of the incident. And the response was, it was about 12 hours. Rapid response was valuable. Um, right, that sort of goes to what um, Adam asked about, you know, how, how, what was the, the measure of good response? Um, and, you know, if you set up SLAs, obviously we did not have an SLA, just a good agreement that if people called us, we would respond. And so um, our instant response team did respond in a, 
in the evening. It was like 9 p.m. And um, but it had already been in place and running uh, for about 12 hours before that happened. And they were able to triage it quickly, um, cut off the external thing and cut off the external communications pathways. Um, it depends on your level of instrumentation. Fortunately, the university had uh, the type of things that in the in the infrastructure they could hunt this down. Um, it was just the physics astronomy was almost a black box from our perspective. We didn't know what was there. So we had to really go investigate after the fact to find out what the broader impacts were. But it was about 12 hours. Thank you. And then we've got a question here. Do you have a recommendation for how other institutions can approach this issue of departments that want to, uh, quote, go it alone before it becomes a problem? Um, let Vaughn throw in that one. I have some comments, but I've been talking a lot. So let's see. Vaughn, do you have some? Yeah. Um, so first of all, let me just acknowledge that this is uh, a department going it alone by some sense is more the rule than the exception. I mean, our universities are very much, you know, federated to various degrees, organizations of, of department. And I think, um, you know, we can we can have debates about the level of autonomy that a part departments should have, uh, but there will be be some level of autonomy. Uh, what I have found to be instrumental here is the, the, the careful balancing of carrot and stick. Um, so on one hand, we want to make sure that departments fully understand the risks that they are taking on when they go it alone, and then also recognize their autonomy to go ahead to accept those risks. Uh, when they do it. They may have some, some services that are just so core to their particular model that they deem those risks to be worth it. Then we also balance that by, for example, I mean, Trusted CI's whole um, stance with the NSF community, right, is we're here to educate, to provide services, and then to lead, but we have very little direct authority. Uh, well, frankly, we have no actual direct authority over other projects in the NSF space, uh, besides you know an implied endorsement um, from NSF and funding us to be out there and making us available, so we have to work largely with social channels by convincing them that cybersecurity is valuable to their mission uh, as a department, as a pro as a project, and help in help entice them some sense to speak to take cybersecurity seriously. And so that that means you know speaking their language, uh, you know talking about things in a science and a research context. You know the way Andrew put things: lost research, you know lost years of research productivity, um, is is something that science you know departments understand. IT downtime. You know if you're a dean of a department, IT downtime is not meaningful to you until you translate it into re you know lost research productivity. So this is the sorts of things where we we uh, broadly here, I mean, I think the information security community need to get good at in terms of talking uh, to our constituency about our importance to them. And hence, getting back to the question now, convincing them why not going alone uh, is probably not the ideal case for them. So um, I can throw a little bit of historical knowledge about what was happening in Michigan State in the previous years previous to this. Um, the university had done a centralization model of IT. I think it was around 2019. Um, it was prior to the CIO that's currently here as well, Melissa, as well as me. Um, and it didn't go well as, as centralization of IT models go. So that was one of the reasons why physics and astronomy was um, out there on their own, if you want to call it out there. Um, they had their own go it alone model, um, mostly because of the questions about what is a um, centralized organization going to provide when you need customized things. Um, Melissa's uh, role when she's come out as a CIO in 20, 2019, I think it was late 2019, uh, was about, oh, sorry, about 2018, was in the aftermath of the centralization model that wasn't going well. So we were trying to. Um, lay this all out. And so that's one of the reasons why physics and astronomy was in their own box, if you want to call it that. Um, but the, uh, the recommendation, I would say, for organizations that have distributed IT, 
Um, if you can find ways to take advantage of the distributed um, decision making, which is a good thing in my mind. But what you have to remember is that a department may not actually be spending time looking at threat intelligence or seeing what's going on in other universities and dealing with a larger model. So we have to be able to change scale and scope. And my, my recommendation would be is if you have a distributed uh, research model, and many universities do, that um, you need to build communication channels with your central IT people. And the central IT, as well as your information security team, need to realize that they're not researchers. And researchers and research in itself sometimes is the inverse model of a operating business model that you would see. So it is challenging for us at, at R1 research universities and even smaller research universities to make sure that um, our control setups and the, and the type of risk management we do has to know that there's gonna be a higher risk in those areas. Um, what I think this incident has proven is that it's not so much about sensitive information, although that was effective in this particular case. You have to look at the whole program now. And researchers need to go, know that um, your information security team uh, and your CISO and, and, and the like have a, a broader problem because they are dealing with, um, I would say, larger scale of, of security threats than you see. So the idea is to not let any gaps occur between the distributed teams as well as your central team. And, um, and then rely on us because we'll know, and ideally from this webinar, you will know that this type of hole does occur in, in a research university and how you can be uh, responsive to that. Um, but if we all go along, we eventually will, will fail together. Thank oh, you. Uh, oh, sorry. The correction, there was Melissa started in December of 2019. So um, we've got a question going back to the um, the downtime when you were cleaning up the issue. Um, you had responded that it was 12 hours, and the question is, 12 hours seems pretty fast. What worked to raise that alert? I'm also curious about the flip side. Uh, did any tools that you expected to work not work? Okay. Downtime is not what I was meaning, and I'd like, I'm sorry if I created that impression. No, that's that they were probably, back up in 12 hours. That's my that's that's my misunderstanding. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, they were not back up in 12 hours. It was from when we notify were notified that there was a problem that we were able to triage the con connections and then start suspending services. So that was when the beginning of the downtime. So that was 12 hours from notification to when we had pretty much a good set of triage uh, things in place. Um, but on the flip side, tools that we expected to work, we uh, um, basically uh, we received some, some tools given to us by a vendor who was actually in a um, RFP with us. And um, it was quite effective in actually finding and identifying which machines were, were deployed. And actually, um, we did not choose that vendor for endpoint detection service product. Uh, it was in the middle of the RFP and they just gave it to us as a crisis. So it's very, uh, very handy that that was there and it did do a lot of the, the identification, uh, but not specifically cleanup. So it was not deployed before the attack. Now, many universities do have endpoint detection response services deployed in their environments. And um, unfortunately, I think many research systems don't get into that scope. And uh, that wouldn't be helpful. So um, bottom line, we were lucky. Okay, we've got another, thank you. We've got another question here. Um, well, this is more of a response to a comment. So I'll, I'll go back and read the, the other comment. Um, I want to echo Vaughn's praise here, talking about what happened um, is the challenge and I'm glad they're doing this webinar. Yes, thank you, um, Tom and uh, Trusted CI uh, security team for doing this and uh, publishing the report. Um, and then to add to that, agree with Adam, uh, we need more people and orgs coming forward to describe attacks, their response and what they changed as a result. I uh, can't thank you enough. So yes, we appreciate that feedback. Um, Vaughn, did you want to um, discuss some other issues? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I've got a couple more prepared questions here and why we let the audience uh, format their, their own. So let, let me, um, Andrew, ask you to talk a little bit about if there was anything that emerged from, you know, we've talked about, you know, uh, the, the centralized IT in the department. Uh, what in particular do you think departments can be focusing on to improve their security and resiliency that, that emerged from our report? Uh, yeah, uh, so first, 
setting up the relationship or dialogue with centralized IT, as Tom has been talking about, uh, should be their primary focus. Um, centralized IT does have many tools and resources that departments can leverage. But in parallel to that, uh, depending on the amount of people time a project is willing to or able to invest in, a uh, few hours is all that's needed to perform a cybersecurity survey, which is a great way to explore your cyber infrastructure and its current security posture. Um, I can't tell you how many engagements that Trusted CI has done where we just start off with a survey and the engagees, departments, and, and or projects, you know, just they're like blown away by what they didn't know about their cyber infrastructure. So as I said, great first step. Um, if you have about a half an FTE over a three to six month period, a project can seek an engagement and or consultation um, from external groups that focus on security and academia like Trusted CI. Um, and with an FTE or more, a project can develop and implement a security program like the Trusted CI framework, which if done correctly is gonna result in the strongest security posture. So the big takeaway here is that perhaps the most important action a project and or department can do is to ensure that adequate resources for cybersecurity have been allocated. And I, if I could, I'd add on to what Andrew is pointing out here. Um, the, the question about distributed IT or departments to go on loan, um, there's the administrative part of the department and then there's the research parts. And they're kind of intermingling, but sometimes they're not, they're, they're not quite distinct. Um, I would like to remind the CISOs and the security personnel out there who are in the audience that um, you're not a researcher. And um, although I, I take it back that I was a researcher and I have been doing science, um, I still don't go in as if I'm knowing what they're trying to achieve. And quite often the researchers haven't spent any time learning what you're knowing. So it is kind of an opportunity to fuse your knowledge, um, get a better understanding of, about your environment. But one way to do that is, I mean, you're a CISO, you're trying to be running an environment and you're trying to run many different systems uh, to keep your organization uh, operating in a threat environment. And you, you need to consider how you would do liaisons with the research departments. Uh, one example would be is, uh, I'm seeing this in high performance and research computing teams. They would hire someone who has actually got a PhD and done the research, but they become the more the infrastructure liaison. That model might be working could work. And we haven't applied it here in, in physics and astronomy, but we are starting to see how we can get our research administration or research computing folks to be the security liaisons on, on these particular areas. So keep that in mind. If you're seeing the world totally differently from your researchers and researchers see the security world totally different from you, you have to reach out and find a way that you can um, at least have common language between yourselves. That's a good way to get started. Let's um address this because it's related to what tom is saying and then we'll go back to the other question um on the flip side of andrew's last answer i wonder if you have feedback on how central it can assist departments with leverage centralized resources i appreciate tom's comment on essentially humility so like tom you're saying meet them where they are at essentially um yes and then um amazingly you'll find that there are people who know um some things about their environment, about the, the research environment, that you could actually apply those lessons across other parts of your university. So keep that in mind too, that you could be a, an educator as well. Um, going back uh, to another question here, um, was any effort put toward identifying the attackers by MSU or other organizations, Tom? No, we did uh, provide that information. I mean, the NetWalker group posted their information on their Twitter feeds and on the dark web pieces because that's how they tell you that they want a ransom. Um, we did refer that to law enforcement, but as you can see, um, those are far and few between to be able to uh, attack, uh, find state-based actors or um, international things. If they were on our campus, we would have found them, but um, they were not. Uh, what a shame. <laughs> um, Okay, going back to the uh, the question about you know bridging the gap between in these individual departments and the central IT. Um, this person saying we had success hiring a department IT staff member who was hired by the department with input from IT, but who functionally reports to IT to ensure central tools and expertise are used, and that the department IT person is using best practices. Okay, um, 
moving forward, how, how to proceed with the interface to central IT when a particular unit is operating under a higher level of security, for example, PHI or classified project um, asking for a friend. <laughs> um, Andrew, you might have a picture on that. How are many universities addressing these um, higher level security research? Uh, enclaves, unfortunately, but uh, it, it, so the bottom line is centralized IT probably can handle or, or can at least help you um, review and audit your systems to ensure that they do you know, satisfy either FISMA or, or uh, HIPAA or whatever you're doing. I know, for example, Carnegie Mellon University does that for us at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, um, but that is our way of handling that. Um, we, we simply request them for audits and reviews. That's kind of what I did in my old branch before I was at Michigan State. We built a secure research environment uh, with the goal of applying the type of uh, control space that was negotiated by all the researchers who bought into that. Um, but it was aimed at having the data um, available, but to not the whole world. How about that? Um, the idea was that when you were doing clinical type of clinical and translational research, you had to de-identify the data, which then put a whole lot of overhead on the researchers. But then they didn't have to have security overhead because they could just use standard academic computing services. Um, by creating an environment where they could have identified patient type of data in their studies, um, they, one, clarified their ability to make accurate answers, um, but they had, um, they just would rely on the environment at that point. So that is kind of a model. I would like it to also see if I can find ways that each one could be more ato atomic. Um, the promise of cloud-based computing and, and government cloud services um, have the capability, but then you've seen there are a lot of risks to that environment. And if your central IT people aren't really running cloud environments, they're not gonna know your risks and let alone tell you what your basic best practices are. Um, so it is a, a Wild West. The problem is the Wild West is much more impactful than it used to be. I might offer one perspective on this. You know, but before even whole departments start working at given levels of security, usually you have individual researchers who have gone out and gotten a grant and that comes with some sort of data use agreement or something of that nature. So the, the first step I would encourage any central IT unit is to have a very good office with their, a very good relationship with their office of research administration so that they're consulted and are aware of when these, what are initially one-off grants. So for example, this is how CUI started here at IU and is now starting to, to snowball some. And then as this grows to the department level, you can sort of start shifting it from one-off services to things where you now have things like enclaves or aligned centralized IT infrastructure. And I think uh, one of the trickiest parts of my job is to figure out when that tipping point you know, has occurred. When do we have enough uh, CUI that it start, should start becoming a centralized service as opposed to a set of one-offs? So I think there's an, an evolution there in terms of, of that relationship, but my, my main thing is Get a good, good, a good relationship with your Office of Research Administration so that you can collaborate on tracking that, those sorts of demands. Thanks. Um, Vaughn, back to you. Yeah, I think we're um, really appreciate the, the good questions from the audience here. And let me thank uh, Julie and Andrew and Tom for this report. And of course, Tom and all of his colleagues, uh, particularly CIO Melissa Wu and the leadership from physics and astronomy and everyone we interviewed on being able to, uh, the collaboration that made this, this whole report possible. And I'm extremely, uh, it's hard to say I'm happy about something like this, but I'm, I, I'm, it's, I think it's great that we're able to have this sort of positive impact um, from what would otherwise be, you know, just a negative event like this. And so, of course, then as always, I think the, the National Science Foundation and the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure for funding trusted uh, CI's work. And of course, as always, this is a, 
the opinions of the, the project and the others here and not those of, of NSF. So I uh, just want to uh, thank all those involved. And one last time, another reporter to the report, and we hope you find it useful. And if you do find it useful, uh, please do feel free to drop us a note. We'd love to get that sort of feedback, or if you have other suggestions or complaints or criticisms, happy with that. And uh, Jeanette, how about I turn it back to you at this point to wrap us up? Right, so going back to uh, your request for feedback, um, here's the, all the different ways to stay connected with Trusted CI. We've got our monthly webinars, um, email lists, um, ask us anything, no question too big or small at info at trustedci.org and we'll triage your question to make sure it gets to the right person. Uh, you can follow us on at trustedci.org or um, our blog. Um, so many, many ways to, to connect with us. And um, this is the last webinar for 2021, but I do have a webinar schedule for 2022. So I just wanna say, we're going to be talking about um, the EDUCAUSE HECFAT and our engagement with Ohio Supercomputer Center. And um, I'm very excited about this engagement. I worked on it. I'm very excited to help share the heck that with the interested uh, parties in the trusted CI community. So uh, be on the lookout for notification about that webinar. And uh, with that, we've got a lot of people saying thank you in the chat. So they really appreciated this presentation. Good, good job, everyone. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Jeanette, just thank you for another year of uh, Trusted CI webinars and organizing the series and, and uh, speaking purely as a presenter, making it easy for us. You're very welcome. All right, everybody. Have a great day.